So uh, thank you guys for coming, and uh, I would warmly like to welcome uh, Fiona Staples, if you would. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Nathan. <laughs> uh, my, my pleasure, my pleasure. Um, so uh, we're all here out of, out of uh, respect, love, and passion for the work that, that this woman has done. Uh, but I think today, like uh, some of the most important things that I think we kind of wanted to talk about, and especially you, was uh, process and craft, uh, and especially me, storytelling uh, and character. Um, so I'm, it's definitely something I'm really, really interested in. And now that I've finally had a chance to addictively read Saga uh, and catch up on, on your past works, uh, I'm, I'm anxiously, greedily awaiting, uh, as I'm sure the rest of you are. Uh, but. Um, in terms of credentials, uh, just to make sure I get this right, uh, we're dealing here with, let's see, Joe Schuster, Eisner, uh, Hugo, Harvey, uh, and British Fantasy Award winner, uh, and uh, as well as obviously uh, illustrator and uh, comic book cover uh, artist. Uh, worked with people, uh, Brian K. Vaughn, Steve Niles, Andrew Foley, Brian Wood, uh, Mike Costa, and quite a, quite a few others. Um, but uh, in, in Talking to you recently before the talk, I, I, I got a hold of your parents, and uh, and you are from Canada. That's true. That yeah. is, and there's this <laughs> thing with wilderness, and and they they kind of let it slip that you really are from from another world, and uh, you came here on on kind of with a winged funny train. Trains, yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. That's me. Uh, but um, but the but in in the conversation, I mean, the one thing that the one thing I did find out is that you love goblins. Oh, that's true. Yes. I don't so, know, I read a lot of goblin literature growing up. Yeah, yeah. So, w which is really interesting because the, the, the characters you've created and, and kind of the world that exists and the development that's there is really, really quite fascinating. And there's, to, I, want, I would love to know a little bit more about this kind of goblin addiction. Oh, I don't know. I guess it started <laughs> when I was pretty young. Not I don't know, I had all smarter, these books yeah. about goblins. There's one... Um, gorgeous picture book that was my favorite children's book when I was little called The Rainbow Goblins. It was illustrated by, I forget his name now, I think it's Old Rico. He's a yeah. oh, the European rainbow? like nobility. <laughs> and he just spends his time like crafting these beautiful oil paintings yeah. and making them into children's books. So there's that one. And um, The Princess and the Goblin by George McDonald. Yeah, yeah, I, found, I, found, I definitely found some research on that one. I never uh, actually saw the movie, but my daughter actually knows about it. I didn't the know book. there was a movie. But yeah, yeah, the book is amazing. Uh, and obviously the movie Labyrinth. Like, every yeah. girl born in the 80s, I was obsessed with the movie Labyrinth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, but what is it? There has to be something there, because that, that or at least in the beginning, because I was really curious about kind of how you got your start. And, um, you know, it in terms of what the goblins are, I mean, that, that, that type of fantastical creature, I mean, that's not exactly, that's not exactly Garfield. Right. You know, and, but you, you, you also kind of, kind of told me that you, you really kind of lost yourself in nature and you kind of did it on purpose, right? You yeah, could, I was always interested in like exploring, you know, the spaces around me or like wandering off yeah. <laughs> from my parents. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I guess um, I was interested in like mythical creatures and fantasy stuff and mm -hmm. was always like daydreaming when I was a little kid. And I guess that ties into my love of creating fantasy worlds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's especially, I mean, did that kind of spark this horror, kind of the, the, this real passion for horror and kind of suspense that you've, your work has kind of, you know, kind of flown in there and really been dramatized and, and, and uh, you know, come to fruition through? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I guess the seed was always there, of like a little, being a little bit more interested in darker fiction or spooky stuff. Yeah. I didn't really get into horror, though, until I started drawing horror comics, which is um, done to death. <laughs> My first comic series that I yeah. started doing in 2006 was sort of a black comedy about vampires. Um, and that's, I never really enjoyed horror movies or anything like that until yeah. I started doing horror comics. And then I thought I should educate myself about the genre and just started forcing myself to watch scary movies <laughs> until I developed a taste for them. <laughs> so, were the, so were the, I mean, 
in terms of goblins and like these kind of night, you know, creature things, I mean, do you have like stuffed dolls and figurines everywhere? Mm -hmm. And like, do you do you kind of cast and create no, your own? No, I don't own... really collect stuff like that. No. But, um, mostly just books, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So is is it more of like the that imaginative, you know, headspace of fantasy that really started to kind of launch your interest in in like storytelling and and character creation? I think so. Um, I, I had a real interest in visual storytelling, you know, because when I would, when you read a book, you see very clearly in your head. Like mm -hmm. It creates images in your mind, and you visualize it clearly. And I just thought, um, when I was reading the story, what I imagined was so cool, it was probably worth like recording. So it takes like a certain amount of arrogance yeah. <laughs> to believe that. <laughs> but yeah, I just thought. Uh, the things I was seeing in my head deserve to be recorded somehow and like made real and brought out into the physical world. So I always enjoyed um, doing drawings and uh, you know creating representations of the things that I would read, mm -hmm. um, which is basically what you do when you read a comic script and turn it into a finished book. Yeah. Well, then, I mean, so in terms of the of the work that kind of preceded, you know, done to death. I mean, how how did how did that kind of visual storytelling really evolve for you in terms of process? Like, what what were some of the grandest mistakes that you know, or, or you know, not some necessarily mistakes, but or at least in the art vernacular, mistakes that you kind of learned from, you know, uh, happy accidents, you know, things that have really kind of sparked or or kind of launched that kind of next level or step up. You know, as you were as you were beginning, and especially as you started to kind of transfer and elevate from traditional medium into the digital world. Well, there were a lot of mistakes in the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> I started drawing comics when I was um, in art school. I was majoring in illustration, um, and one of our projects was to do a comic. We also had this sort of open portfolio building class where we could do whatever we wanted, and that was when I started working on Done to Death, and. I don't know, at the time I just wanted to experiment and play with different media and do a, a type of comic that wasn't really on the, I don't know, on the stands or it didn't look like a typical comic. So I was playing with a lot of paint and inking it with crow quill and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think my mistake was um, trying too hard to make it look different, something, yeah, something <laughs> forcing a style, I think. And, so, so um, like writing a letter to God, you know, was kind of kind of your your thing of maybe that was a little too much and just focusing on kind of your, yeah, your voice? Um, I think as, as I've gone along and done more comics, um, I've started to put storytelling first and um, actually created less stylized work and mm -hmm. more realistic figures. Um, and just striving for clarity above anything else. Yeah. Well, how how, how was the shift kind of going from, uh, you know, something like that horror genre to, you know, mystery society and then, um, you know, like working on like the Northlander stuff? Um, it was actually a lot of fun experimenting with different genres, mm -hmm. um, especially historical stuff like like Northlanders and, and Jonah Hex. Um, so what do Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, I've always liked playing with um, historical costume and those settings. Yeah, well, that, that, that leads into, into two more questions. I mean, how do, how, do you, how do you find your hook in a narrative? You know, like, what, what is it that, that speaks to you about those projects that you took on? Um, you know, like, how, how, do you, how do you kind of find your place in something that's, that's completely brand new? Um, for these particular series, um, like Northlanders, for instance, I just did a fill-in issue. Mm -hmm. So there was already a narrative and there was already a world that was created and I was just sort of trying to fit in with what, you know, yeah, what, an existing Yeah, the legacy series. that came before. Uh, yeah. yeah, but then also in terms of the Mystery Society, I mean, how do you, how do you kind of find your way or, or kind of anchor what you, um, how you approached it? I just try to work closely with the writer mm -hmm. and study the scripts and talk with them and figure out what they're going for. I guess, yeah. until we agree on sort of a tone and a, a take on on the subject that would be appropriate. And in, in terms of, of fashion, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you've, you've got some really great character designs and really amazing kind of costumes that, that really feel new and, and fresh. And, and as, a, as a character designer, 
you know, how is that, how is that relative to, you know, what you, what you want to do? Because I, I, think, I think I read that, you know, superheroes really weren't your kind of bag. Not exactly, no. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, I mean, you, you, uh, anything you approach really seems to have, like, this, this, this really fresh kind of vibe and, and kind of energy Thanks. to it. And it really does seem like everything is is considered, especially in terms of of costume and and setting. You know, mm -hmm. is there is there something that kind of sparks that that uniqueness? Um, I just try to make sure that uh, the costume makes sense for the character and makes sense for their setting, and just feels natural. Mm -hmm. Not something that I that I'm giving them just because I like the way it looks, but you know, consider the practical side of it. So, so you're not like a fashionista with like a closet that has tons of collections? <laughs> not really. Um, I'm kind of interested in fashion. I like looking at it, I guess, and I like using it as inspiration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, cool. Um, well, uh, in, ter in terms of process, you kind of have this great, uh, this great little collection that, um, that you sent. Um, so mm -hmm. could you kind of speak us and, you know, talk us through kind of kind of your, your process process? Yeah, this is going to be sort of a saga page from start to finish. And you see the finished page on the left there. And then these are my thumbnails, which is the first step of the process. Um, I start with a new, brand new script <laughs> printed out. And I read through it, and I make little notes in the margins. And that's where I do like pre-thumbnails, like really tiny ones, just yeah. in the margins of the script. and then. Those become my bigger thumbnails. This is just a eight and a half by eleven, so I have a printout of like four pages on it. Yeah, were they were they always kind of this uh, this simple and 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 concise? I mean, did you start out doing like full yeah. page? Or? <laughs> no, um, I think when I first start working with a new writer, my thumbnails are slightly tidier and a little bit more detailed, but they're generally pretty minimal. Um, I don't put anything like clothing details or detailed backgrounds in them. Because um, they're mostly just to work out layout and staging. Mm -hmm. And um, I always like to include the dialogue balloons just as a reminder to myself to make room for them and also to make sure that the staging works with the, with the, um, th with the dialogue. Yeah, so you kind of know what's <coughs> where you need to leave space and where things are going to go in the yeah. future. And I always like to make sure that um, the characters are placed in the order that they speak mm -hmm. so that the the balloons always read from left to right, and the characters are standing in yeah. the order that they're speaking in. Do you ever have any like nerd nerd out technical issues with like breaking the 180 rule? And yeah, sometimes the 180 rule like directly conflicts with having the dialogue balloons in the right order. Yeah. But when it comes down to it, I'll always um, choose the dialogue first yeah. <laughs> to make to make it easy to read. Um, because with Saga especially, we have a lot of first time comics readers, people mm -hmm. who have never like picked up a comic book before, and Sometimes those readers are put off by things like balloons in a weird order with lots of zigzagging or overlapping tails. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think that's uh, important for the storytelling to make sure that they can easily read the dialogue and it's in the right order. <laughs> so I arrange the page that way. Okay, cool. And then, and then, what do we what do we have here? This um, I don't know if you can see the light pencil lines, but. I scan in my thumbnails and I blow them up to page size, and then I take them into Manga Studio, um, and I shoot photo reference of myself. There's a picture of me reading the book. Yeah, but <laughs> Marco's you, mom. You you really you really kind of get into character though. Like you you kind of do yeah. the lunges and the jumps and the poses and the facial yeah. expressions. And, <laughs> yeah, I actually find it really helpful to. Um, to sort of act out all the motions that the characters are doing and, you know, get into character to a certain extent. Yeah. Uh, I find that when I, when I do that, when I get in front of the camera to shoot photo reference, I end up, like, pulling poses or facial expressions that I wouldn't mm -hmm. necessarily be able to think of just sitting at my desk with a piece of paper. Sometimes, like, in the moment, you come up with a gesture that you wouldn't have been able to imagine otherwise. Yeah. Um, what well, does it? Do you think it? It really? Because it at least at least for me, I, I kind of do the same thing. So, it, but it, mm -hmm. it that that kind of mind space and approaching story, it really kind of gives you a sense of that kind of physics, you know, and, and kind yeah. of that feeling and emotion of something. Yeah. 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 It also gives you a sense of the space. I think. Yeah. <laughs> exactly how spatial with, um, it is. With staging and with interacting with the other characters. So, um, 
Yeah, then I um, I blow up my thumbnails in Manga Studio and I just ink over them. I use them as pencils. Um, yeah, and oh. Let's see. Can you go back one? <laughs> oh, sorry. Let's see if this thing actually works. Um, okay, so then I, I take the line work and I import it into Photoshop, which is where I do all of my colors. And um, I sort of am doing this kind of cell shaded look for Saga, where mm -hmm. the, the characters just have simple flat colors on them and then the backgrounds are painted. So to separate the characters, I just sort of select them and fill them in with this placeholder gray while I render the backgrounds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that photo that you see there is just one that I found as like a color reference. Yeah. So, um, oh, this is the video. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just sort of using the eyedropper to sample colors from my photo, and I'm painting with those colors because mm -hmm. I, I liked the palette in the photo. Yeah. So, so then in, in terms of, of the rate of a page like this, I mean, how, how would you kind of schedule your... How would you schedule like your day to day? Like what you know, how long does it take and what, what do you do when you are you walking in and like bunnies, you know, goblin slippers and, and with a cup of coffee or <laughs> I get dressed, but I get dressed in my home clothes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, <laughs> so there is a wardrobe. There is a yeah. wardrobe. Gotcha. Loungewear. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, so this is sped up several times. Um, the video is I think ten minutes long but it represents two hours of drawing. Yeah. So I think I average out to about a page a day. Like I'm doing an issue a month, roughly. Yeah. Um, I don't actually do a page a day. I'll have days where I just ink and then days where I just color. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, do, you, do you kind of jump around? I mean, is this ever, the, the amount of work that you're producing is exceedingly prolific. I mean, how do you, how do you kind of stay fresh with that, that kind of workload? I mean, that's, Aside from this insane addiction that we all, I think it's safe to say we all share, <laughs> um, you know, like how, you know, how do you, how do you kind of make ends meet and, and stay sane? Like what is your, what is your kind of pre professional studio practice? Um, like just day to day? Yeah, like day to day, I guess. Like, uh, you know, in order to meet those deadlines and kind of make, you know, make, make sense of it all. <laughs> Sorry, my bad. Um, I don't know. I've just settled into a routine now, I guess. Where yeah. I don't know, I get up in the morning and make breakfast, and then I like to ink in the morning and then color in the afternoon sometimes. Or, yeah. I, <laughs> I try to, my best to stick to a nine to five schedule. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really work out that way most of the time, but no. that's my goal, and it keeps me from having totally crazy hours. Yeah. And it keeps me on the same schedule as, like, you know, my boyfriend and my friends so that mm -hmm. I can have some sort of life. <laughs> well, I, th I think it's really cool, though. Um, the, you, I mean, you, after, we were just talking, after an arc, you take, like, two to three months off, right? That's right, yeah. Um, so Saga has sort of six-issue arcs, and after each arc is finished, we take two or three months off. Mm -hmm. uh, the book goes on hiatus for a little while. Yeah. Well, we sort of take a couple of weeks off just to relax and then get a head start on the next arc, yeah. which is where we're at right now. So that's definitely helped me stay sane. <laughs> and when you, when, you, when you got started, I mean, were you keeping like those, you know, 14 hour, 16 hour days like mm -hmm. to get stuff done? Or? Yeah, uh, it was very difficult in the beginning. <laughs> and it still gets hard towards the end of every arc when I start to fall behind schedule again. Usually yeah. by like the sixth issue of an arc, I'm like scrambling and going yeah, crazy. Yeah, like rushing to catch up. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so it's uh, as as prolific and awesome as your stuff is. It's it's really humbling to know that you're human. Oh yeah. <laughs> no, it's very hard. <laughs> yeah, it's very difficult. <laughs> uh, well, the, the the pages look great. And then Thank you. you know, I, I guess could you talk a bit more about you know like your kind of your sketches and character development? I mean, is this sure. is this literally what your 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 sketches look like as you evolve? Are these like final? Um, these are not just like rough sort of sketches, mm -hmm. like my own personal process. Um, these are the sketches that I would send to Brian if we're doing a new character. Mm -hmm. um, I don't send him concept sketches for every new character, just if it's someone that maybe will be around for a while, mm -hmm. or if he hasn't given me like a, a big description of them, then, then I'll do a drawing just to make sure yeah. we're on the same page with it. Um, like for the brand, for instance, our new freelancer, 
assassin lady. <laughs> um, Brian didn't give me too much of a description. He just said she's a brunette in a trench coat. So <laughs> uh, I had like a very clear idea of what I wanted her to look like, and I wanted to make sure Brian was on board with it. So I did yeah. some sketches to send him. Oh, that's that's some amazing, uh, amazing freedom. That's that's pretty great. So I mean, I, I think I think I read somewhere too that you. If if you have something you want to draw or you know something pops up like you guys are are literally in in like equal collaboration in terms of of a lot of content that really kind of, kind of goes into it. <laughs> yeah, um, I feel like we have a really good collaboration going on, yeah. and um, uh, our process has been really streamlined by now, where there isn't a whole lot of back and forth or. And we don't take a lot of time to figure out what we're going to do because there is mm -hmm. no time. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, he just sends me the script at this point. I send him my thumbnails to look at. Mm -hmm. And then I go straight to finished artwork. And he's never had any notes on the finished artwork. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've ever had to change anything. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Well, how, how, I mean, how is this? I mean, not, obviously not to name names. That's not why I'm asking. But like as, as a creator, you know, there are, there are varying varying degrees and, and experiences and relationships of collaborating with other, you know, other writers or other companies, you know, or, or even other artists. You know, I mean, how, is, is there something that's really unique about this? Because even, even the breadth of your, of your work to date, and, and I mean, it obviously seems like you're, you're really just kind of, kind of getting started. You know, so like how, you know, is there something about this that, uh, you know, it really seems to me that there's something going on within just this relationship and this narrative that, that really has kind of been something unique and, and special. Yeah, um, I sort of had the feeling that Saga was something special when I was offered the job um, because I had to decide if I was ready to do an ongoing series. Mm -hmm. um, I'd never done anything this long before. I'd only ever done like six issues at the most of any other book mm -hmm. and this was gonna be like an infinite number of issues basically because we don't know how long it's going to go for <laughs> and it would probably take like 10 years of my life or something. Yeah. Um, so it was a really big commitment and I had to sort of figure out if I was ready for that but I don't know. I think all along I knew that I wouldn't be able to turn it down because I have you know, a lot of respect for Brian and I really like him as a writer mm -hmm. and he turned out to be like a super decent person as well. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I felt like if I was ever going to commit to doing like a long form series, this mm -hmm. is the time and this is the perfect situation. And and how many Cintiqs and styluses have you burned through? Um, only like one and a half. One and a half? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I started out with a smaller 12 inch Cintiq. Oh yeah. And then I sort of graduated to a 21 inch one and I haven't completely burned through it yet. It's still sort of hanging in there. <laughs> yeah. I go through a lot of it. stylus nibs though. Yeah. Yeah. I think I press too hard. So what well what what can you tell you tell us about kind of where where it's all headed? Can you tell us anything? Um not really. No. Not without, without huge spoilers. <laughs> where is it headed? Well, we're gonna follow Hazel's story, maybe for her whole life. That is really, <laughs> that, is really that, that is not the She's really getting for. older, and yeah. we're going to watch her. <laughs> watch her grow? <laughs> yeah. She's a toddler now. <laughs> awesome, spring chicken. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a long way to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and in, in, I guess in terms of, the, of, that, of that kind of, uh, that legacy and kind of, you know, building this dynasty, you know, this, this amazing, you know, sci-fi action soap opera. You know, how, I mean, do you watch like Young and the Restless? I mean, how do you kind of, no, I? <laughs> how do you, no, how do you, well, that, that's my thing. You know, how, how do you kind of prepare for something like this coming from like, you know, at least when you approached it, you know, as a, as a creator, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing from the goblin fantasy kind of, you know, chapter book, you know, amazing literature. I mean, this is kind of like, tackling something like that as compared to, you know, romance, vampires, and, you know, action-packed, you know, detective mm -hmm. spy stuff. <laughs> you know um, I mean? Was there, was there, you know, any kind of prep? Not really. I don't, I don't know. I didn't really know what I was getting into until I started. I didn't know what it was going to be like. I've never done anything similar yeah. to this before. So I'm, I'm still kind of um, learning on the fly yeah. <laughs> as I go along. What I did know was that I would be doing this for a long time and I had to do it in a way that I could grow as an artist while working on the book, mm -hmm. not get stuck 
um, working a certain way or doing a certain style or method that I would hate two or three years down the line. Yeah. So I tried to pick a, a technique um, where I could develop my drawing and painting skills mm -hmm. simultaneously and a style that was kind of flexible mm -hmm. that could represent a lot of different things, <coughs> a lot of different types of story. <laughs> because, I don't know, saga is sort of a genre mishmash. Yeah, yeah, very much so. So I guess in the beginning, I just tried to um, stay open and stay flexible. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I guess, I guess kind of one, one last question before we kind of hit, hit some questions real quick, because I know a lot of people must have them. Uh, one bit of advice uh, in the form of a story. What is the best lie you've ever told, and did you get away from away with it? Oh Jesus! Uh, <laughs> Not to put you on the spot or anything. I never get away with lies. You never I, get away with I, lies. Like, always get. All right, well, <laughs> I'm a what was the, what was the best one you ever told? Was there was there like a lie that really kind of like awesomely stuck out that just worked? Nothing. Nothing worked. Um, no stories. Kind of no <laughs> art of persuasion. Um. No, sorry, geez. Uh, I can't think of it. No. Once I told my boss that I broke my tailbone when I didn't want to go to work. <laughs> you broke your tailbone? <laughs> yeah. I well, guess, that's a pretty good one. I guess you could say I got away with it because I didn't go to work that day. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you. All it's right. really the only thing I can think of. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you. You're, you're a good sport. I wasn't prepared. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. All right, so I guess uh, I guess now um, we'll open it up for questions. Who's got who's got some? Yes, ma'am. You're quick. Uh, I think it was issue 11 with the controversy of Petrobras Square. Did you guys foresee that happening, or uh, um, I don't know. Yeah, I didn't anyway. I don't know. Maybe I don't know. Brian might have. He's the one with the master plan. <laughs> but. I don't know. When I was drawing it, I was kind of like, is anyone going to object to the penis? And then I thought to myself, well, no, we've shown stuff like this before, so it's probably no big deal. Our readers can handle it. <laughs> some, um, some people have some, some people don't. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I didn't think the, that comicsology would like end the book or anything would happen. But, I don't know. Yeah. Um, you've done a lot of collaborative work with writers before, and obviously Saga is a testament to that. And in general, for you, personally and as a professional and as an artist, like what do you look for, not just in a script, but in a writer to collaborate with? Like what feeds you creatively when you collaborate with someone else? Uh, well, first of all, um, I like them to be a trustworthy person. <laughs> I think um, even before their story or their abilities enter the equation, they have to be someone that I want to work with. Um, someone that, uh, that I trust to take me Seriously, there has to be like mutual respect there. Uh, and when it comes to their writing, um, they just have to have an idea that I like, I guess. It helps if they're open to collaboration, but <coughs> if they're super great writers, that's not even a requirement, really. <laughs> I just have to, have to like their story, I guess. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, yeah, so there's, at least for me, there's a lot of. Um, weird and interesting sexuality and imagery of Saga. And I keep, when I'm reading, I keep finding that some of that sexuality is kind of toying the line between where sex turns to violence. And I was wondering how much of that is conscious, uh, determined by the writing, or where you go for inspiration into imagery that, that, you, that you come up with for some of those scenes. Um, are you thinking of a specific scene? Uh, I, I mean, for me, it shows up in a lot of places, but I, it might just be me. So. <laughs> yes, it might be. Um, yeah, I, I think the, the the scene on the sex moon, um, the, the, all the imagery that's that's built into there. I think the image of the stalk herself mm -hmm. uh, has a weird kind of sexual, um, but but dangerous energy to it. Yeah. Uh, so just stuff like that. Um, I think the stalk is meant to be sexual, just to be like a little bit gross, in the same way that the alien <laughs> films are, <laughs> where they they use a little bit of body horror. And 
monsters that look like genitals to freak you out. <laughs> so, and yeah, the stock is meant to be is sexy but threatening at the same time, so that's sort of where that comes from. And the sex scenes, I try to treat them all differently depending on the context. Like an orgy on sextillion with a bunch of sex tourists is going to be really different from, you know, a love scene between Marco and Alana. So I just try to take the context into account and generally um, present sex as positive and not exploitative, um, unless it is on the brothel planet. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it is really interesting, though, that, that, that you know, sex within the book actually plays, like, it has an intrinsic narrative role to, to kind of the, the saga of saga to begin with, and I mean, mm -hmm. in, you know, in, in, at the birth of the baby, and, you know, kind of moving it, moving everything through, literally from page one. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, was was that ever, uh, you know, I guess kind of where a lot, of the, a lot of those questions kind of headed, like, was that ever any of any fear or comfortability? You know, like, is there, is there a, a level or something that you won't cross, you know? Um. There is, but we haven't reached it, and that's where I think, uh, it's important to trust your writer to uh, not go to a place that you're not comfortable with yeah. and to sort of um, be someone that you can talk to about those things and figure out um, what you're, what kind of material you're willing to do. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel do you feel a certain level of responsibility uh, in the execution of these things, or is it is it really just it is part of the story, so it has to be in there? That's just story yeah. Time. I don't feel like it's too gratuitous anything. Mm -hmm. It is always part of the story. I think we just, we present sex like we present anything else in the comic as just another part of life. And Saga, the story, tries to represent a lot of different facets of life yeah. and of creation and death and violence and everything else. <laughs> it's kind of all-encompassing. It's got sort of a wide scope. <laughs> so yeah. It's just uh, just another thing everything that we would take. try to cover. <laughs> <laughs> Sir. Yeah, I was just wondering, who's your favorite character to draw in Saga? Do you have one? I like them all. Um, <laughs> I really liked drawing the stock while she was around. I'm pretty <laughs> fond of Isabel and Marco's mom, Clara, as well, because they're both kind of mean and sarcastic, and that makes their <laughs> facial expressions a lot of fun to do. <laughs> do you, are there any, are you pulling personalities from like family, friends, boyfriends? Vengeance, um, revenge, through <laughs> character design. Not really. I think Brian's such a good writer that I don't need to, you know, use anyone else that I know for inspiration. I can just I get it all from the script. Like mm -hmm. it's all in there. Cool. Anybody over here, sir. Yeah. Um, you do a lot of organic work. I was wondering, how do you feel about transitioning towards more metallic imagery? Is that just something that's challenging, or? Yeah, it would be very challenging, but it's something I'm trying to work on. Um, right now, I'm honestly not great at doing tech stuff or mechanical things, but um, if I have to, I'll just you know try to do a lot of research and find reference and get it done. Yeah, <laughs> something that I'm learning as I go along. Who's the most difficult character to draw? The most difficult character. Um, Hmm. Good question. <laughs> uh, it could be someone like the Will or the Brand who is very reserved. Um, the Will, for example, is a very emotional person, but he has a different way of showing it. He's not as explosive. He doesn't wildly gesticulate like <laughs> like Isabella or some of the other characters might. So um, I have to figure out a different way to show what he's feeling because he doesn't necessarily show it on his face. Yeah, there's just some great quiet soft moments when it's obviously he's he's in love and you know yeah. they, you know he and the stock have this connection and you know it's, so, yeah. it, it's this nice this nice like dry He's quite stoic. Yeah. But at in, the same the time he's very emotional yeah. <laughs> inside. <laughs> he's a well heart of gold. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, in terms of jobs? Yes. Um, 
Well, Dead to Death was pretty important because it was the first series that I did and, and finished. So um, that was a really important learning experience because it was the first time I realized exactly how much time goes into creating a comic and how difficult it is and just like the sheer volume of pages required. <laughs> Which, it's one thing to imagine them, and then it's another thing to deliver them on a schedule. So yeah, my very first comic was um, a really good experience. Um, well, that's a, that kind of leads into a great question. Uh, in terms of the value of the 24-hour comic, oh, yeah. you know, like, w how important was that? You know, like, what, was that, was that something that might relate to kind of lessons learned and kind of immediacy and, yeah, and I think so. kind of effectiveness in time? Yeah. Um, when I was at, when I was in college um, and working like part time in a comic store, uh, the store that I was at held a twenty four hour comics event. Which I don't know if anyone has done one, but you basically just have twenty four hours to complete a twenty four page comic. And yeah, if you guys haven't done it, I don't know. <laughs> it's pretty exciting. <laughs> so it was a group setting. I was like in the food court of the the local mall with forty other artists and a sitting at tables. And, yeah, and. It, Man in an adult diaper. <laughs> all kinds of people, all walks of life, <laughs> all doing like 24 hour comics. Um, so that was the first issue of a comic that I completed. <laughs> and yeah, it was good to sort of you know stretch all of your art muscles <laughs> at the same time and um, see what you can accomplish in 24 hours. And it's a really great confidence builder to see uh, what you're capable of, I guess. in doing like a pure fantasy series. Um, 
don't have a specific idea for a world that I would like to play with, though. Um, other than other than that, I'd like to do a fantasy series, and I'd be interested in, in doing an all ages book, which is something I've never done. I've never done anything that I could show a child. <laughs> I think it'd be kind of cool. <laughs> covers is similar to the way that I paint a background, where um, for this one, for instance, I'm just starting with the sky, with the background. <clears throat> um, I started by laying down like a sort of warm yellow to give it a little bit of warmth shining through the, <coughs> the cooler tones. Um, and then, now I'm just tightening it up a little, rendering some clouds. So, yeah, typically what I do is I just do like a loose wash of colors and then on another layer over top, I just tighten it up a bit. But uh, a lot of your a lot of your your experience in traditional mediums, the things you learned in painting, color theory, all those things kind of come mm -hmm. to bear in terms of bringing those those fantasies and those images to life. I mean, I think uh, um, you you do an, an amazing amount of research and, and shooting your own photography as well for mm -hmm. reference. Uh, but in terms of uh, like building those worlds and building these covers, I mean, are, are there influences or specific things you go to for you know for the the completion of these you know, kind of images and worlds? Uh, yeah, every cover is different, so I'll do you know, I'll do a different reference hunt for each one <laughs> to find cool images. Uh, there's a lot of painters that I'm inspired by. Um, I really like Tommy Lee Edwards right now. His work. Is amazing. He's another person who's who draws and paints, and you know, he's good at it all. <laughs> I think we have a lot of the same influences. Um, I'm really into Drew Struzan, who did all the classic movie poster art of the '70s and '80s, um, and just like classic Golden Age illustrators like N.C. Wyeth and Howard Pyle. I've always been interested in, in that sort of that sort of painting um, and in book illustration and book covers any kind of painting that holds a narrative. Yeah. Are there are there any uh, in terms of movies and compositions, I mean are there you know, is there anything outside of comics, you know, and, and illustrators and painting and kind of what you do as an artist, but that that outside stuff. I mean, are you, you know, inspired or influenced, you know, in terms of character design by science or, you know, psychology and, you know, movies. I mean, is there any anything that kind of really informs and kind of inspires that? Yeah. Um I like animation. Certain ones really inspiring. Um, old Disney ones and some anime like uh, Studio Ghibli and uh, the movie Tech on Concrete. Yeah. Um, which I love the comic it's based on too, Black yeah, Boy. Black so. um, stuff like that. Uh, that's that really inspires my background. I think that's sort of I don't have enough time in the month to do the backgrounds that I would like, but it gives me something to strive for. Yeah. And, um, and sometimes I just go on Pinterest and look for pretty images, yeah. <laughs> yeah. nice looking homes that I can use in Saga. Yeah, I think, I think it was really interesting once too, you, you said to design, uh, design specific cities and cultures and worlds, you would go to the Greeks, you would kind of go to, you know, right. Aztecs, you would kind of go to all of these things housed in history, culture, and reality in order to kind of get that, yeah. get that reference. Yeah, for Saga, I always try to be more inspired by the real world to take it from real life locations or history than pulling from other sci-fi stories mm -hmm. or from other fantasy stories. Um, because for one thing, I want it to feel sort of grounded in our reality. Um, it feels like there's an identity. I mean, there's bears and you know, yeah. I mean, there's, there's dogs, <laughs> there's Adidas. You know, I mean, there there are these <laughs> there are these things that we recognize yeah. that I think we all kind of take for granted. But you've got like this great subtle twist 
mm -hmm. plus wings and horns, you know, to kind of like fill the fill this out. So I mean, it really the, it kind of has that fresh, you know, immersiveness when you when you open a page. I think it's really a great, very simplistic, uh, but powerful, you know, kind of design. Thank sense. you. Um, yeah, I guess I just want Saga to feel like it's based on reality and not based on Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Oh, um, yeah, I had the sort of rocket ship tree in the foreground, so now I'm just coloring that in. Um, let's see if this little steps. This is the size of the video. This is like my entire screen that I yeah. captured. Yeah. <laughs> this is my center screen. Nice. Sorry, I tried to zoom in, but apparently I'm not that deaf that Kino is there. Do you make your own Photoshop brushes, or do you use specific sets? I don't make my own, really. Sometimes I just, I usually just use the defaults and tweak them slightly, like changing the opacity or the texture. Uh, lately I've been using Kyle Webster's brushes, which I like a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. me too. Yeah, I recently just discovered those. Mm -hmm. So that there's no, like, you know, book of Fiona brushes coming out in time soon. No, because I only use like two brushes, really. <laughs> um, I don't know if you can see my brush shape in the video, but it's just like a slightly textured rectangle brush, mm -hmm. and I use that for almost everything. For and then like um, another version of the same brush, but brown. Those are like the two that I use. <laughs> well, I, th I think that speaks to your creativity <laughs> yeah. very, very well. Um, last, last couple of questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, you were saying that Um, if it's an alien creature that's not even remotely humanoid, then um, I won't bother taking photo reference. <laughs> I might find a reference images of an animal, if it's the rough shape of like a, a rhino or something, then I'll just look up a bunch of photos of rhinos. But um, if it has, you know, two arms and two legs and a head, then I'll pose as it. <laughs> Alright, last question. Alright, yes ma'am. One more question about uh, collaborating with writers in general, and, or well, in, in this specifically with uh, Brian K. Vaughan. When he sends you a script, for example, um, because it is so collaborative, as he, because I know with some writers what they'll do is they'll essentially give you a full spiel about the panel and how everything's supposed to be set up, and since it's more collaborative between you and Brian, are you basically thumbnailing it um, without any like panel instruction, or is he basically sending you a manuscript? Um, his scripts aren't especially lengthy or anything. They're pretty average in terms of format, which is like a page of script per page of comic. And he does break it down into panels, uh, but he doesn't really give me layout direction other than sometimes saying, um, this is the biggest panel in the page. Sometimes I have to disregard even that because he has two biggest panels of the page. <laughs> um, so yeah, the layout is pretty much just up to me, and I just try to keep it simple and as readable as possible, not do anything crazy with different panel shapes or mess up the order or anything. <laughs> uh, does that answer the question? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. All right, well, cool. Well, I guess I guess one one last one last story question. Uh, what what bit of advice would you give in terms of, of what story means to you and how, how somebody kind of coming up or, or even trying to improve or elevate might, might consider something uh, you know, to, to improve their, their kind of storytelling abilities? Um, I think the most important thing is to be a careful reader, assuming you're working with a writer and not writing your own material. Um, really analyze the script and really sort of figure out um, what's important in your particular story, what are the themes, who are the characters really, um, do you empathize with them, uh, can you put yourself in their shoes, and also to study the dialogue in each panel because the work has to be perfectly in sync with the dialogue. Um, what is the character saying in this particular panel and how does their entire aspect reflect that? Yeah, it's very much like a subtlety. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Sometimes their face or their body language might completely contradict the dialogue because they're being insincere or there's a double meaning. Mm -hmm. So it's just something that you have to be aware of. Oh, that's great. Well, uh, thank you guys for joining us. Thank you.